it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For those who depend on the law are heirs of faith, means nothing and promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that there may be grace that may and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who are of the law, but also those who have faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. And it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, and God who gives life to the dead and called into being and into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope, Abraham against all hope, Abraham in hope. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was like, whoa, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be, without weakening in his faith. He faced the fact that his body was good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the, regarding the promise of God, but he was strengthened by, in his faith and giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were, not, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Anywho, though. So, we just struggle busted our way through reading Romans 4, verse 13 to 35. But, that's all right. That's all right. Um, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep chugging along, you know. It seems like a lot of things are going through your head right now, but I'm going to start. Anyway. For since all God's dealings with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob happened before the giving of the Mosaic law, we can't say they were based on the law. Instead, they were all based on God's declarations of Abraham's righteousness through faith. Faith is the ground of God's blessing. Abraham was a blessed man indeed, but he became heir of the world on another principle entirely. Simple faith. The law cannot bring us into the blessings of God's promises. This is not because the law is bad, but because we are unable to keep it. Okay, so I'm writing the law isn't bad. It, it just exemplifies that we're in need of a savior, which is kind of what Pastor Jesse keeps reiterating. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Our inability to keep the law, our transgressions, means that it becomes essentially a vehicle of God's wrath towards us, especially if we regard it as the principle by which we are justified and relate to God. What? Yeah, no, no, I, thought, I thought I was going to say what you were just saying. And it didn't. Well, it kind of is. Kind of, but not. It's a little different. Yeah. Anyhow. How can Paul say this? Because transgression is the right word for overstepping a line. And this is for breaking a clearly defined commandment. Where there's no line, there's no actual transgression. I feel like that's kind of where we got, right. like where we're at now. I mean, like as a society with like the fluidity, like there are no lines. Mm -hmm. So if there are no lines, then you know, there sense. are no transgressions mm -hmm. because there aren't any lines. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Where there's no line, there's no transgression. And now like the whole thing is, Fluidity. Yeah, I mean, that's what they would say. Like without God's law, like we would evolve into anarchy. Yeah. Because if everyone's their own God, like who so who sets the laws? Thou yeah. shall not kill. Thou shall not steal. Yeah. No, I agree. There is sin that is not crossing the line of the law of Moses. The root of sin isn't in breaking the law, but in breaking trust with God with denying his loving, caring purpose in every command that he gives. Before Adam sinned, he broke trust with God. Therefore, God's plan of redemption is centered, centered on a relationship of trusting love, faith, instead of law, keeping. When we center our relationship with God on law, instead of, of trusting love, we go against his whole plan. Thoughts? That's the point. What? About how crossing the line. 
in order to open it is breaking the law, but it's breaking the trust. And I think it was just in a business aspect. Like, if you're going into business, like, you know, a merger or something like that, you draw up a contract. And the contract clearly states you will do this, and the opposing party will do their obligations. Yeah. And you mess it up. You don't follow your contract. I mean, most businesses, like, you know, that would, that would kill the contract. That would be over with. And, like, Jesus is very God found another way to kind of circumvent the contract and do that because he loves loves us. Yeah, I'm writing that um, God's redemption is based on restoring a trusting love. I mean, because kind of going back to Adam mm -hmm. or even Eve, because Eve's the one who originally ate the apple and then convinced Adam, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. If she would have trusted God and his word, then she would have had faith. And because of that trust and because of that faith, then she would have obeyed. Mm -hmm. Instead of seeing it as, well, I obey so that God will love me. Yeah. Whereas we love God, so we obey. Yeah. And if you have that loving, trusting relationship and somebody you love and trust says, don't do this, mm -hmm. you don't do it because you love and trust them. Yeah, you don't do it out of fear. And you don't do good things out of, you know, the hope that God forgave you of your transgressions and your sins. Yeah. And you can do it because you love. Yeah. Okay. And then the next one is 16, I said. Next one is 16. Justification according to the grace through faith. Faith is related to grace in the same way works is related to law. Grace and law are principles, and faith and works are the means by which we pursue those principles for our relationship with God. Sense. Yeah, I think so. So, so I guess, like, for, like, the way it kind of makes sense to me is, like, the speed limit is the law, right? Yes, I'm aware of that one. Okay. Are you? Yeah. So, the speed limit being in the oh, law yeah, we'll keep going. is the way it works. So, like, the, our works would be driving the speed limit. If we did that, yeah. Yeah, when we do that. <laughs> when we do that, not speeding. When we do that. Forgive us. I'm from New Jersey. It's like, what do you expect? I got you. I got you. I got you. Um, I'm following. Yeah. No, but seriously. Um, so, like, kind of like the same thing, like, faith and grace. Like, we can't do anything. Like, God's grace is always there for us, right? Like, yeah. our faith is kind of like driving the speed limit. Like, we just have faith in God. We have faith that God is good and that his grace is there for us. Therefore, we are saved. This kind of, oh, my mind makes sense. That makes sense? No. Okay, yeah. I don't know. I'm not even trying to challenge it because, like, yeah, I think I'm just going to dig myself into further holes. So, come on, yeah. I'm just writing what it says. Okay, looking at it this way makes more sense. So, grace okay. and law are the principles. Mm -hmm. Faith and works are the means to pursue the principles. Mm -hmm. So, if you have faith is the means of pursuing grace. Works is the means of pursuing goal. Like that. Yeah. Right? That makes sense. Yeah. Clicking in the head. Anyway, so I'm going to read this one again. To speak technically, we are not saved by faith. We are saved by God's grace, and grace is appropriated by faith. B, salvation is of faith and nothing else. We can only receive salvation by the principle of grace through faith. Grace can't be gained through works, whether they be past works, present works, or promised works. This is because by definition, grace is given without regard to anything in the one who receives it. By definition. I'm going to write that down. Well, I'm going to write down uh, grace is unmerited favor because that's what Pastor Jesse says all the time. Grace and faith are congruous, like congruent, and will draw together in the same sharia. But grace and merit are contrary the one to the other and pull opposite ways. And therefore, God has not chosen to yoke them together. Cool. The promise can be sure if it is according to grace. If law is the basis of our salvation, then our salvation depends on our performance in keeping the law. And no one can keep the law good enough to be saved by it. A law promise of salvation can never be sure. 
If the promise were of the law, it would be unsure and uncertain because of man's weakness, who is not able to perform. If our relationship with God is according to grace, not circumcision or law keeping, then that relationship is for those who are of the faith of Abraham, even if they are not of his lineage. A Gentile could say, I am not a Jew. I am not of the law, but I am of the faith of Abraham. And he would be just as saved as a Jewish believer in Jesus would be. The fulfillment of the promise in Genesis 17, 4 through 5 is found not only in Abraham's descendants through Isaac, but especially in his role as being the father of us all who believed. And those believers come from every nation under heaven. Purge thoughts. No thoughts. No. Straight crickets. Straight crickets. Love that for you. 17 through 18. The life-giving power of the God Abraham believed in. Even as it took a supernatural life-giving work to make Abraham the physical father of many nations, it also took a supernatural life-giving work to make him the spiritual father of many nations. These works of God demonstrate his ability to count things that are not such as our righteousness as if it were, as in counting us righteous. If God could call the dead womb of Sarah to life, he can call those who are dead in trespasses and sins to new life. I'm greedily, just kidding. I'm greedily comforted when God speaks about me as righteous. Did you say that? (laughs) Greedily? It's greatly. It's like you repeated it. I'm so concerned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first of all, you did not even read the whole thing right. So don't uh, ask I'm me what the word. That like, will I even know. Okay, first of all. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh. I'm going to cry. Okay, hold on. I got to get myself <laughs> together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. It's okay. <laughs> <sighs> you okay. You okay? You good? Take a sip of cold, bro. It's empty. Just gather yourself together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's just coffee water. Mm. My favorite. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm greatly. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Comforted. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Uh, stop. Okay. <laughs> we have to get through this. Okay. 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 Are you good? I'm just serious from now on. Just shut, shut it down. <laughs> okay. Stop. <laughs> Are you done? I'm, I'm just going to sit back here, okay? Just look at the screen. Okay. <sighs> It's like I'm preparing for the Olympics of reading. Not very lucky. Okay. Mind you. I'm just going to skip it. Comforted. When God speaks about me as righteous, justified, glorified, holy, pure, and saintly. God can talk about such things before they exist because he knows they will exist. Call them up. Call them out. You know what I mean? Speak love. <clears throat> This life-giving power was accomplished in Abraham as he believed. The power was evident naturally and spiritually. Abraham's example also helps us to understand the nature of faith. The conception of Abraham's son Isaac was a miracle, but it was not an immaculate conception. Abraham's faith did not mean that he did nothing and just waited for God to create a child in Sarah's womb. Abraham and Sarah had marital relations. 
<laughs> and trusted God for a miraculous result. This shows us that faith does not mean doing nothing, but doing everything with trust and reliance on God. Ooh, sizzling. Okay, so I wrote that faith doesn't mean doing nothing. It means doing everything in my power and trusting that God will do the rest. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like when people are like, oh, I'm just trusting in God. I'm just waiting on God. And it's like, but what are you doing? Yeah. Like in the meantime, what are you doing? Are you praying? Are you fasting? Are you like, I want to lose weight. I don't want to be healthy. I want to change my lifestyle. But are you educating yourself on that? Are you getting a gym membership? Are you eating healthier? Are you meal prepping? Are you meal like, are you doing everything in your power to move in that direction and then trusting God for the rest? Mm. You know, I'm just writing um, Genesis 21, one through three. This is where um, Abraham and Sarah have Isaac. And I mean, they said it pretty bluntly. It wasn't through immaculate conception. Like they had to, you know, do aid to get it done. Mm -hmm. Anyway, all true believers like Abraham obey. Obedience is faith in action. You are to walk in the steps of faith of Father Abraham. His faith did not sit still. It took steps. And you must take these steps also by obeying God because you believe him. That faith, which has no works with it, is a dead faith and will justify and never. Mm -hmm. That's what the pressure says to us all the time. The church always made the move. Yeah, that's our, one of our core values. Sense corrects imagination. Reason corrects sense. But faith corrects both. So faith corrects both imagination and sense. It will not be safe sense. What is safe? Safe sense? Have you even heard of that? No. Neither is the web. Saith. Saith. Archaic. Third person singular present of say. Okay. It I cannot see it, like it cannot it will not be saith sense. It cannot be saith reason. It both can and will be saith faith. For I have a promise for it. Trap. Thank you for saying that. Sure, like the 1900s. Archaic. He's archaic. Say it. That's safe. Oh, that's one. There to put. Yeah. <clears throat> Whatever the owl was like, you know, prominent in the Are you going to write that? No. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. So 19 to 22. Wait, where did this end? 35. 35. Okay. Abraham's faith was strong. Oh, so you are going to write it. I thought you were talking about what we just read. Anyway. <clears throat> No, I was talking about the heading for the next one, yeah. 19 to 22. The character of Abraham's faith. Abraham's faith was strong, but it was also strengthened. He was strengthened in faith. The idea seems to be that Abraham was strengthened in his faith, but Paul could also mean that Abraham was strengthened by his faith, because certainly both can be true. Doi. How we need to be strengthened in faith. Dear brother, little faith will save thee if it be true faith, but there are many reasons why you should seek an increase of it. Spurgeon. Spurgeon knew that ministers and preachers especially needed to be strengthened in faith. He sometimes shared his own struggles in this area from the pulpit, but wanted to make it clear that his struggles in faith should never be indulged. Whenever, dear hearers, you catch any of us who are teachers doubting and fearing, do not pity us, but scold us, period. Mm. We have no right to be in doubting castle. Pray, do not visit us there. Follow us as far as we follow Christ. But if we get into the horrible splow, slough, Wow. Of despond, or that means slew. 
The card was literally. Okay, I don't know these old words. That's fine. That's fine. Oh. That's right, honey. Mm -hmm. Slew. Slew of Despond. Come and pull us out by the hair of our heads, if necessary. Don't come up. That's what it said. Mm -hmm. But do not fall into it yourselves, Spurgeon. He was onto something there. Yeah. I'm going to write that down. Okay. I think that's good to, like, just say, because I, I feel like I said this in one of my older videos, but we do. We get into listening to podcasters. We get into listening to our pastors, YouTubers, things like that for doing all the work for us, for our faith, instead of doing it for ourselves. Yeah. And I love listening to podcasts. I love listening to other people. But that's why this time for me is so important. Because if I don't know the truth, then I can't spot a lie. Yeah. And if my pastor is saying something that's not true, or that's a lie, I know Pastor Jesse has come back like a weekend after and said, hey, actually, it was brought to my attention. You know, I misspoke when I said X, Y, or Z. Yeah. And I feel like that's why as a congregation, it is our responsibility then to know the word and to know the truth, not so that we could be nitpicking our pastors and telling them when they're wrong, but also so that if they're starting to, you know, fall in their faith, that we can pull them up, that we can be there to say, hey, teacher, like, it seems like you've gone a little off track. Like we should be praying for our leaders. We should be praying for our pastors. We should be praying for our government because they also need wisdom and discernment. And at the end of the day, they're still humans. We just read that in Acts today when Paul comes to the house or maybe it's Peter and the guy like bows to him and he's like, get up. Like yeah. I'm just a human. Yeah. And I was thinking like also like as far as like being a leader and being like, you know, in, Pastor Jesse's stance, or even Pastor E, or any pastor for that matter. Yeah. Like, you were held to such a high standard. Even yeah. In God's eyes. Yeah. Like, because even like that, the principle falls when the guy was talking about the children. Like, you know, basically, like, if anyone causes these little ones to fall and stumble, yeah. stumble it'd be better to be thrown into, you know, the, the lake or the ocean or the body of water yeah. with a millstone tied around your neck. Yeah. And, like, in addition, um, I forget the Bible verse on top of my head, but there's one in the Bible that talks about how the, the shepherd would be held to a higher standard than that of, that of the sheep. Yeah. The leaders are held to a higher standard, yeah. Yeah. And then God looks up when, God, when you get to heaven, like, if you were let a congregation be led in the wrong way, like, yeah, like, ultimately everyone's salvation is on them individually, but if you're the leader who caused all those people to stumble, yeah, it's the same as, you know, if you, you want a little ones, because the little ones even refer to those who are little in their faith. Yeah. But also, it could be anybody. I think that's also like, um, kind of like what we were talking about on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I heard someone talking about the whole submission thing with wives, and they were saying how submit to your husband to wives seems like such a heavy burden, this, that, and the fifth and the fourth. But that as the husband, as the leader, mm -hmm. so much more falls on your shoulder. I think this was Melina who was saying this, but that so much more falls on your shoulder because you are responsible for leading me and all of our children and our children's children. And you're responsible for being that leader and being that voice and speaking up against things that are happening in our family or in our home. Mm -hmm. And that that falls to you. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's my responsibility to submit and that can be hard and difficult in our flesh. We fight against it, but it's also your responsibility to lead us well. And you are held to a higher standard and it is expected of you to strengthen your faith and to know things and, to be able to disciple and pray to us, kind of like that reel you were sending us, mm -hmm. where the dad's in the car, like awesome. talking to his kids about patience the fruits of the spirits and patience and how they're going to demonstrate that that day. Like it, that's a father's yeah. responsibility. Yeah, and it was even in the video, like you know, really like stood out, like yeah, how he took the walk, like the fruits, and like you know, like people just quote the fruits, but they yeah. actually won't physically apply them. Yeah, like in that in that video that he was talking to his kids, he's like, when your brother really annoys you today, we're going to show him. Yeah, it's not even like kindness. if, like when he does, we're, we're going to demonstrate this. Patience. Yeah. We're going to yeah. demonstrate sharing and like, you know, he's just kind of like applying the verses in the Bible to like a real life situation so that yeah. a child's mind can actually rationally grasp those concepts. Yeah. Like when you walk, when you talk. Because I mean, I'm an adult and eyes. like, you know, even that, like one A, like I'm bad at this, like I, right off the top of my head, like I don't know all the fruits of the spirit. I can tell you that. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I know, like, you know, peace, patience, kindness, forgiveness, like, I told, I told yeah. you, got a number in fours. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, my point is, like, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll track your <clears throat> You should know them. I absolutely should know them, but even as not knowing them, like, well, I forgot my point. Kind of like, like maybe, maybe it's what Pastor um, Luis was saying about even if you don't know what the word says, you're still responsible for it. Like his analogy yes. was about how we can break the law knowingly. Like when he's speeding, he broke the law knowingly. He knew that he got a ticket for it. Yes. But then when he was trying to turn over and people didn't let him over, he also got a ticket for failure to maintain lane, but he didn't know that was a law. Mm -hmm. So you can break the law knowingly or you can break the law. How did he put it? He used a very good word for it, Pastor Luis. I love having my notes right here. He said, you can break the law in intentionally or negligently. Yeah. And negligently is breaking the law because you didn't know it. And the Bible is so clear. That's not an excuse. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you're done up about it. Which is funny because he did that sermon on this section. Yeah. So. Which then, like. That's how that applies. Yeah. But yeah, so that's a good point. That's. Mm -hmm. What he was saying about the two different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you should know the laws, basically. So. You should know the laws, but I have that verses app for memorizing scripture. That's how I memorize them. Yeah. I mean, I we're all two different standards, like you know, like in in that aspect, because like kind of what we talked about, like you know, the pig meat who's in you know Africa or whatever place yeah. in the world, they obviously don't have this, but here we are, like we have full access to scripture, we have yeah. full access to knowing. We're failing first. an open book test. We're, exactly. We're failing yeah. an open book test. We but, have several books. Um, it's our responsibility to open them. Six, seven, eight, yeah. nine, ten. Ten books right here alone, plus yeah. the entire library my dad has downstairs, plus the WWW. Books, and then the whole internet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any vigil. We could talk about this for hours. We could. <clears throat> I mean, you only have one minute left. So. It'd be a little late. Let's come. I can't be lonely. I do not think, I do not think we shall have many conversations unless we expect God to bless the word and feel certain that he will do so. We must not wonder and be astonished if we hear a dozen or two conversations, but let the admonishment be that thousands are not converted when they hear such divine truth and when we ask the holy spirit to attend it with divine energy god will bless us in proportion to our faith it is the rule of his kingdom according to your faith so be it unto you O oh god give thy ministers more faith let us believe thee firmly so you will be blessed that's kind of what i was saying to you about us and just our future and what we're doing that like you will be blessed in accordance to the to the proportion of your faith mm -hmm. which is why like we should be praying over our unbelief we should be praying over our doubt and that one verse which i really love where the guy says i believe but help me with my unbelief when he's yeah. asking god or he asked jesus to raise his son from the grave and he's like do you think i can do it and he said i i do but help me with my unbelief yeah. That's the thing, like, you know, we can't be afraid to ask Jesus for, like, you know, like, yeah. hey, forgiveness, because, like, you know, something that I constantly call myself in is constantly, like, you know, asking God to, like, forgive me for, you know, X, Y, or Z, but, yeah. like, you can also ask for, you know, like, wisdom, and, like, you know, wisdom with Solomon, or faith, like, and righteousness, like Abraham. Yeah. Like, you know, we can, you know, cite these people in the Bible, and go to Jesus and say, like, you know, Lord, like, give me, you know, that wisdom. Give me, give me, give me. Just kidding. Yeah, and, like, you know, and, like you said, like, you know, the Holy Spirit will bestow that upon you. If you ask yeah. for wisdom, Jesus is generous with that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> He's generous with that stuff. <laughs> and I mean, like, he will give you opportunities to be wise. Yes. You well, that me. that's also the warning that be Pastor careful. Jesse yeah. said. Be careful. careful. Careful what you pray for. Pray for patience. He, he will give you many opportunities. opportunities. To be patient. Anywho. <clears throat> it's like a muscle. Yes. Abraham, in faith, did not look to circumstances, his own body and the deadness of Sarah's womb, but he looked at the promise of God. 
in 419, there is contextual, there is textual uncertainty as to if we should read, he considered his body as good as dead, or if we should read, he did not consider his own body. Either is possible, though the second seems to be a better choice. His faith did not waver, and it gave glory to God. Though it was a huge challenge, Abraham remained steadfast, steadfast in faith. When there is no contest, it is true. No one, as I have said, denies that God can do all things. But as soon as anything comes in the way to impede the course of God's promise, we cast down God's power from its eminence. Abraham's faith came because he had been fully convinced of God's ability to perform what he had promised. Is your God too small? The God of Abraham was able to perform what he had promised, and Abraham was fully convinced of this. Some people don't come to Jesus or don't go further with him because they are not fully convinced that what he had promised, he will also, he was able, uh, he was also able to perform. They think it's fine for them, but it won't work for me. This thinking is a devilish attack on faith and must be rejected. This kind of faith sees the work of God done. It sees the work of God in the immediate. Isaac was born in fulfillment of the promise and in the eternal accounted to him for righteousness. Mm. Abraham's justification and our own. It wasn't only for Abraham's benefit that God declared him righteous through faith. He is an example that we are invited to follow. It is also for us. Paul's confidence is glorious. It shall be imputed to us who believe. This wasn't just for Abraham, but also for us. When we talk about faith and saving faith in Jesus, it is important to emphasize that we mean believing that his work on the cross delivered up because of our offenses and triumphed over sin and death raised because of our justification is what saves us. There are many false faiths that can never save, and only faith in Jesus, in what Jesus accomplished on the cross and through the empty tomb, can save us. Faith in the historical events of the life of Jesus will not save. Faith in the beauty of Jesus' life will not save. Faith in the accuracy or goodness of Jesus' teaching will not save. Faith in the deity of Jesus and in his lordship will not save. Only faith in what the real Jesus did for us on the cross will save. Mm -hmm. The resurrection has an essential place in our redemption because it demonstrates God the Father's perfect satisfaction with the Son's work on the cross. It proves that what Jesus did on the cross was in fact the perfect sacrifice made by one who remained perfect, even though bearing the sin of the world. The ancient Greek word translated delivered was used of casting people into prison or delivering them to justice. Here, it speaks of the judicial act of the Father delivering God, the Son, to the justice that required the payment of the penalty for human sin. Lots of those in there. Mm -hmm. Jesus' resurrection also includes his sacrificial death, but it brings out the all-sufficiency of his death. If death had held him, he would have failed. Since he was raised from death, his sacrifice sufficed. God set his seal upon it by raising him up. Christ did meritoriously. I had to work it through. Meritoriously, 
work our justification and salvation by his death and passion, but the efficacy and perfection thereof with respect to us depend on his resurrection. This one verse is an abridgment of the whole gospel. Wow, that's deep. Mm -hmm. In this chapter, Paul clearly demonstrated that in no way does the Old Testament contradict the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. Instead, the gospel is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, and Abraham, justified through faith, is our pattern. I'm confused. Did I write this wrong? Maybe I did. Maybe they did. The yeah, page. there's only 25 verses. Okay, what's the next page? Chapter 5. No, no, I mean, in, uh, in the devotion. It's chapter 5. If I want. It's a, it's a, it's a mistake. It's a typo. There's it's not 35. Um, only faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross will save. So, that is all of the commentary, but as... Hubby keeps reminding me he has to go to work. So after we do Enduring Word, we'll do the Essential Study Bible, which includes a sermon by Gene Gens. Obviously, we don't have time for that because we have about 15 minutes. Following that, we'll do the Quest Study Bible, which just has some questions. So we'll go through that. And then after that, we'll read our Student Study Bibles, which just has a breakdown of every single verse what it means, things like that. And then we'll read the Jesus Bible, which points out Jesus throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, things like that. And then we'll go back to our True North devotional. This was from our church. And we'll read the devotional that our church wrote last, which does use a lot of the commentaries that we're reading. So it's kind of just a summary recap of everything that we're reading, pulling it together with some examples that are specifically from our church and our staff. But we're going to finish this either another day or later today. Anywho, if you guys enjoyed this video, if you enjoyed doing a Bible study with us, drop them below in the comments. Let me know if you would like some more content like this. We love doing Bible studies. We are trying to get back into the rhythm of doing this. I don't know if I mentioned this video yet. I don't think I did, but we were doing our morning routine a little bit differently, but because my husband is working a lot more and he has to start work at six, our schedule became a little bit untenable. So now we get up in the four o'clock block, which is brutal, brutal. It could be brutal, but you do what you gotta do. If we have to take like naps or stuff like that later in the day, it kind of is what it is. This is just that unbothered time that we have where we can do this together. We can prioritize this for God and for our marriage. But with all that being said, if you like this video, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe to my page and make sure your post notifications are on because I do post three videos a week, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday, and one today on Faith Fridays. And don't forget, every Wednesday, I post a link for my Etsy shop, giving you guys 50% off. Now that does only last for three days. So make sure to drop down below, click the link for my Etsy shop and use that discount code to get 50% off of all things Bible content. I have prints, I have templates, I have devotionals, all the things. And if you're looking for something specific that you don't see, make sure to drop down below in the comments. Let me know. I am constantly making new templates and new things that I love to list on my Etsy shop. But for now, may the Lord Jesus bless you until I see you guys again. Bye.